My talk uh, is about some work about uh, 20 years ago of, of Mike and myself. Uh, we met for the first time, I think, at uh, the ICM in Beijing in 2002. And Mike told me that the work that Schiffman and I were doing was somehow relevant to some string theory calculations. And so we started a collaboration on a series of uh, three papers on the statistics of critical points of random superpotentials in type 2b string theories. So the historical background is that Bousseau and Polchinski had proposed that the number of vacua or critical points of the superpotentials in string theory was on the order of 10 to the 500. So that's a story that uh, most physicists know better than I do. So probably everybody in the audience knows about it. And it uh, cast doubt on whether string theory could be used to make predictions. And uh, Singer, I am Singer, used to say at dinner table conversations that string theory was a spin glass. And so our, co our collaboration was intended to study uh, to what extent these statements were rigorously true. And in the same time, Mike studied the same problem with uh, Frederick Deneff. So the, it's an incredibly complicated problem, uh, mostly in a sense because of the incredibly complicated setting for the theory. The superpotentials are holomorphic sections of a line bundle over the moduli space of Calabi-Yau three manifolds. Uh, little was known about the moduli spaces, apart from their third Betty number, which was the dimension of the moduli space, the, the third Betty number of the underlying Calabi-Yau manifold. And they were indeed around, often around 500 dimensions. And um, so we really just wanted to give some kind of formulae that you could use to base some, some at least so, something better than just speculations like Busso and Polchinski. Uh, now, let me see, how do I screen screen? So instead of discussing any recent work of mine, I want to just review the work that Douglas and I did then and explain the, the sort of basic ideas involved, um, how the vacuum selection problem in string theory can be formulated as a, as a kind of lattice point problem for special holomorphic sections of a line bundle over the Clavio moduli space. How to convert this lattice point problem into a kind of continuum problem just by a radial projection of lattice points. And then how to identify the continuum problem with the Gaussian random holomorphic section problem. This is done through uh, what's called the Katz Rice formula. And so I want to explain that. The Katz Rice formula gives a, an explicit formula for the distribution of critical points and critical values of Gaussian random holomorphic sections uh, as a kind of random matrix interval. Now, um, to add something new to the discussion, um, over the last 10 years, people who work in spin glass, sort of mathematical spin glass theory, have used really a very similar techniques to study uh, sort of the same problem of counting the number of critical points of a given Morse index on a space with an enormously high dimension. Uh, by comparison with this extremely complicated setting of moduli space of Clavier manifolds, they are free to pick a model space to do the calculations and they pick a sphere of large dimension and they get much more specific uh, refined results. Um, although I think it's dubious that you can get those results in the Clavier setting, it, it does sort of raise a problem whether there's any kind of analog of the spin glass results in that setting. So here are the papers that uh, the first three papers were the ones that uh, we collaborated on. They're all published in uh, math journals. Uh, simultaneously, Mike published parallel papers or other re related papers in physics journals with uh, Deneth. 
And um, then the more recent paper that I'm mentioning is by Alfinger, Benarus, and uh, Cherny. Um, okay, so um, critical points. So first, uh, let me try to let me define critical points of holomorphic sections of line bundles in general. So the setting is uh, any Kähler manifold, and uh, we have a line bundle over the Kähler manifold. Who's uh, with a Hermitian metric on it, and the curvature of the Hermitian metric is the Kähler form omega. Uh, the connection nabla is then uniquely determined by by that condition, and by the connection form being of type one zero in a holomorphic frame. But I'll ignore technicalities like that. So there's a unique uh, connection people use in the setting called the Chern connection. And uh, we want to study nabla s equals zero. So a lot of the difficulty of this problem is that we cannot use complex analysis. Uh, even though s is a holomorphic section, the connection itself is not holomorphic or miromorphic or anything. It's just a smooth connection. As a result, this equation, we mm -hmm. cannot be really treated by the sort of holomorphic techniques that Schiffman and I had, had been using uh, mainly earlier, one really has to uh, use what are called real variable techniques. And that's what's called, that's what gives rise to the cat's rice formula. In particular, um, there's no a priori bound on the number of critical points of a section, even in any model case, nor a simple analytical formula for the set of critical points. Um, or for the uh, empirical measure, which I write at the bottom of the slide. So we're really interested in this empirical measure where we just put a delta function at each critical point. One could also put a delta function at the critical value at each critical point and get an empirical measure of critical values, which is what spin glass theory studies. Mm -hmm. and so there's no simple formula for these empirical measures. If we were dealing with completely holomorphic setting, we would use the what's called the poincare long formula to construct the delta function on zero sets or critical point sets by just taking DD bar log mod. But it's not available when you have a, for a connection equation. Now, um, I want to compare two things. There are two types of limit problems that people study in this setting. One of the problems, and the one that vastly the most, the majority of papers study, uh, is to fix the manifold M and take powers of the line bundle, which is like studying polynomials of degree N with N tending to infinity. And then one can study the zeros and critical points asymptotically as the degree tends to infinity. So this problem uh, is also, this is actually studied in the middle of the two pa of the three papers that we wrote. It's uh, much easier. And uh, to a mathematician, the results are very pleasant. Uh, partly because you get very nice universal results. So almost all mathematical papers, I would say all of them with the exception of the two that we wrote on the actual Club Yau setting are pertain to this limit. But uh, this limit is really, this is a semi-classical limit. It's not really relevant to um, the vacuum problem in string theory. That problem, we really have a fixed degree of the sections. We don't really have a sequence of spaces, but it's more like having a sequence of uh, spaces M sub D with dimensions tending to infinity. That's the spin glass problem. And because the dimensions of the moduli spaces are so large, there's a resemblance between the critical point problem for, grand, for superpotentials and the critical point problem in spin glass theory. You, you, you do expect everything to simplify enormously in the large dimension limit, but it all depends on having the right kind of sequence of spaces, M sub D. Um, so, 
The other thing is that uh, even using, so spin glass theory uses certain model sequences, M sub D, like just a sequence of spheres of higher dimension. But it seems like the, uh, the, uh, the uh, vacuum problem in string theory really is sensitive to all the complicated details of the Clubio setting. So let me talk about just the general formulas that are really valid for like any Kähler manifold in any line bundle. So we're, we're sorry, we're given, first I, I'm, I'll, I'll state the setting, which is that we're given a certain holomorphic line bundle over the configuration space where M is the moduli space of complex structures on a Clabia manifold X of dimension three, and where E is the moduli space of elliptic curves. And I uh, usually just think of it as a uh, line bundle over moduli space of manifolds. Then uh, this is a negative line bundle and uh, only certain sections, holomorphic sections of this line bundle are relevant to the vacuum problem in string theory. Uh, so these are called flux superpotentials. And they're like a set of lattice points in a, in a subspace of the sections. Um, so here I'll, I'll use some notation, uh, just general notation that uh, to be a Kähler manifold means that the Kähler form, this is like the metric, is, uh, has a potential in the sense that omega is I d d bar k, where k is a local, locally defined real function on the manifold. Now the superpotentials that we're talking about are holomorphic sections of the line bundle whose churn class is uh, minus one over pi times omega. The string theory setting gives you specific, specific Kähler potential and Kähler metric and a specific line bundle. Then the covariant derivative of a section is locally given by the formula 11 or one that I wrote here. And so W is holomorphic, and we can see that the first term on the right side is holomorphic, but the second term on the right side is only smooth. The uh, curvature of this connection is minus omega. So in, in, uh, in the string theory, you define the scalar potential, which is given in uh, line two, and it, it's like the modulus squared of the, of the covariant derivative minus three times the modulus squared of the section. So a vacuum point in the string theory is a critical point of this real valued scalar function. And they come in several types, but we're only going to discuss supersymmetric vacua, uh, which are connection critical points in the, in the sense of my previous slide where the covariant derivative vanishes at the point Z. And then for a given holomorphic section W, this, we look at the set of critical points, which is a set of all critical points. So the value of the potential V at a critical point is called the cosmological constant of that vacuum. So it's, it's roughly speaking, it's a critical value. <sighs> So I'm sort of repeating again that it's important to understand that the, the, the set of critical points and even its number depends on the connection and therefore on the underlying Hermitian metric H. Um, the critical point in a local frame uh, is given by the, that uh, connection equal to zero, del S equals zero, which, which says that del log F is del K. And that's a real C infinity equation. So in particular, um, one is used to the fact that uh, counting uh, zeros of sections of holomorphic vector bundles is topological for holomorphic sections. You don't have signs in it and there's no cancellation. Uh, in other words, you have positive intersection numbers, but that's not true here. So the number of critical points reflects two things. It sort of reflects the degree of the holomorphic section, if we vaguely think of it as a polynomial of some degree, 
but it also reflects the degree of this scalar potential K, which is a real function, but we might vaguely think of it as a polynomial of some other degree. So the, the definition of critical point is um, maybe best thought of in completely real variable terms without even using a connection by just taking the pointwise Hermitian norm squared of the section and then looking at the points where that is critical. Now, that's not quite what we want because the, that, that, the critical points of that section, the minima, occur at the zeros of the section. And so to, to, we don't re really interested in the zeros. So to eliminate the zeros, we take the log of the section so that the value is minus infinity. And then we look at the critical point equation. So uh, this is a famous equation that was first studied by Bott in the 60s when he gave a Morse theoretic proof of the Lefschetz hyperplane theorem. And he pointed out that the Morse index, the number of negative eigenvalues of any critical point is at least M. Uh, that's the dimension of the manifold. So uh, when we think about um, spin glass theory later on, they're also interested in counting uh, critical points of any Morse index and any Morse index can arise in the spin glass theory, but not here. So, uh, the, the, the least it's, it's, half the, it's the half the dimension. So the critical point theory of holomorphic sections is the real Morse theory of this function. Now, then you get into more complicated parts of, this, of the string theory, that uh, the physically relevant superpotentials are kind of what are called quantized flux superpotentials. So there are only a, a la set of lattice points in, um, in this possible space. They correspond to lattice points in, in uh, the third cohomology group, X and C. And uh, so in addition, there's something called the tadpole constraint. And the tadpole constraint is like a quadratic constraint that Q of phi is less than or equal to L, where Q is a quadratic form. So in some sense, this is what both Busso and Polchinski were thinking about when they thought that there were 10 to the 500 uh, vacua because they were thinking of this tadpole constraint as, as sort of being like the inside of an ellipsoid and you're counting the number of lattice points in, inside this ellipsoid. In fact, uh, as Mike pointed out, this Q is an indefinite quadratic form and uh, it has a null cone, which divides, divides these uh, G into an inside and an outside. And only the ones on the inside, uh, only, the, only the lattice points in the interior contribute to the vacuum problem in string theory. So, So to repeat, the uh, string theory vacuum problem is to count the critical points of these, of these uh, holomorphic sections W, which are indexed by these, uh, by these uh, G Gs. So here's the, here is the uh, sort of the set of all possible critical points. We union over all of these lattice points G where tadpole constraint less than or equal to L. And then you look at the critical points of the corresponding holomorphic section. So um, we study this by forming what is called linear statistics. Namely, we take a test function psi and we sum its values over the critical points. So here I'm making the potential of the uh, superpotential itself and one of the variables in psi because uh, we also will need to confine the count to subsets of the Calabio moduli space. So the, these uh, types of uh, empirical, this is the integral of psi against the empirical measure of critical points, but uh, yeah. 
And so then uh, uh, we define n sub psi of L to be the sum of these over all the possible flux superpotentials with fluxes satisfying Q of G less than or equal to L. Okay. So I guess I'm just repeating that Busso and Polchinski's original guess on the number of uh, vacua was based on thinking about the tadpole constraint as elliptic rather than indefinite. And it, Mike explained that this was uh, a, really an indefinite lattice point problem, which has been studied much less. But we, we, uh, the main idea that he started with was that we can convert this discrete lattice point problem into a continuum problem because of the homogeneity of the problem, uh, we can just radially project the lattice points onto the surface of the Q equal to zero hyperboloid, or it's not a hyperboloid, but it's something like a hyperboloid. Um, and then convert it into a continuum problem, which is much more amenable. And in, in, in the third of our papers, we prove that this conjecture is true using classical techniques and lattice point problems, yet not exactly standard techniques. So just an extremely brief statement of this, you know, what exactly we did. We, we, look, at, uh, we look at this shell where this uh, tadpole constraint is between zero and one. And then we are, sort of projecting all these lattice points onto the surface, uh, QZ equal to zero. And uh, we look at, uh, yeah, we look at lattice points in a shell of radius L and we get this, uh, this count to here that, the, that if we sum psi over all the critical points and all over all the relevant lattice points, we get L to the third Betty number of the underlying Clavio manifold X, and then an integral uh, <laughs> over the space of sections and over, over the Clavio moduli space of the test functions multiplied by the determinant of a certain Hessian. And so that L to the B3 is, is reminiscent of 10 to the 500, if you think about uh, B3 as being 500, which is not unusual for these moduli spaces. So I'll say more about this, what Hessian we're talking about, but this is the, what's called the complex Hessian. And it's essentially the Hessian of minus log of uh, the norm X squared. We take the, we're taking the expected value here. And so we're, we're, we get a Hessian for each one of these sections S, but when we take the expected value, uh, we get this, uh, this sort of uh, variable, variable Hessian. So if you look at this formula, it's reminiscent of the Katz-Rice formula. And we'll see that coming up in sort of the next slide. Namely, uh, if we had, well, first we can convert that, that, that integral into a Gaussian integral by a, by a standard argument that says that sort of, uh, the Haar measure on a sphere is an equivalent probability measure to Gaussian measure in a sense. You just put it in polar coordinates and you can see that if you have only radial functions, you can integrate out and you, you see that the Gaussian measure and the spherical measure are equivalent to each other. So we rewrite this critical point. This is called the critical point density. Uh, this, we now are no longer integrating over the moduli space. So this is the density of critical points at a point Z in the moduli space. And this, this, formula, this formula is uh, reminiscent of formulas for um, Gaussian random sections of uh, holomorphic line bundles. And so from there on in for the rest of this talk, we will forget about lattice points and we'll only talk about Gaussian random holomorphic sections, which is, um, a much simpler and better studied subject, but in, in this uh, two slides, we're saying that the lattice point problem is equivalent to it.
So here is a uh, general theorem. So we could be on any Kähler manifold and any positive Hermitian line bundle over a Kähler manifold. There's a missing equal, there's an equal sign missing between the K and the, and the formula uh, over here. There's a missing equal, but in any case, the density of critical points, if you take the expected value of the empirical measure of critical points, it gives you a, uh, it gives you a measure on the Kähler manifold which is not normalized because there's no control over the number of terms in the sum. So uh, if you take the expected value of that empirical measure uh, with respect to the Gaussian measure on all of the sections, then you get this formula. So I'm going to take a look at this formula, but uh, the formula involves uh, First of all, a random matrix integral, which doesn't really look that complicated. It's an integral over complex symmetric matrices is H prime, also uh, X and C. And uh, so it's a, it's a random matrix integral involving complex symmetric matrices. Uh, it's, it's a kind of Gaussian integral uh, with this Gaussian factor. So in order to understand this formula and what one can get from it, uh, we need to understand what is this. This is a positive Hermitian matrix on CM. M is the dimension of the manifold involved. The lambda here is a positive Hermitian uh, operator on the space of symmetric matrices. And uh, here M again is the dimension of the underlying Kähler manifold. So it's good to, to take a closer look at this formula because in a way we've sort of reduced everything to try to understand this formula. This is a completely general formula. So it applies in the Calabiao setting. And the main difficulty, well, there's several difficulties. One is these absolute values around the determinant. One of the things that uh, Mike did, I believe with Ashok, is to study what happens if you remove the absolute values and then you get an index density, which allows for cancellations due to signs and it's much simpler, but uh, an approximation to what we get. So these absolute values are from a technical point of view, what causes uh, most of the trouble. The second thing is we need to understand these matrices A and lambda, uh, what kind of data goes into them. So here in this formula, it's, it's, it's uh, almost impossible to get estimates of this, of this integral unless you allow M to go to infinity or you let the power of the line bundle go to infinity. So, Otherwise, we just give a, some heuristic estimates of this integral. I should say that uh, it's very important to understand the distribution of the critical values of the superpotentials, since the cosmological constant is essentially one of those. And uh, later on, I sort of worked out the, the uh, empirical measure of critical values and it's, it's it's for critical points and it, it, on a, in the general setting with Renchi Fawn. So there is such a similar type of formula. Now I only put it in, so here I'm going to give a slide which is going to be unreadable, but it is going to sort of explain what the A matrix is and what the Lambda matrix is. So the point is not to like really read the slide, but just see what kind of data go into it. So here, this, uh, uh, this, the key object here is the orthogonal projection onto the space of holomorphic sections that you're interested in. It might be the entire space of holomorphic sections, or it might be some subspace S of the space of holomorphic sections. This is called the Bergman kernel. If you use the entire space of holomorphic sections, or it is called uh, the relative Bergman kernel if you use a subspace. I uh, note that there's a little bit of uh, 
of, of conflict of notation here. Sometimes I write it as an F and a pi. So F is, the, is really the expression for pi in a local frame. The F formulas are actually more correct than the pi formulas, but I uh, didn't want to explain what the notation F stood for. So just think of uh, Fs and pi S as being the same. In other words, Fs is a scalar function and we omit the frame from it. Whereas in pi S we need the frame. So what is the main point here? We're taking two, two derivatives uh, of, uh, of this Sago kernel or Bergman kernel on the, on the diagonal. And uh, then we have the lambda matrix. This is what's called the Schurk complement of A in uh, sort of a two by two matrix of block matrix. And uh, we can see that these other things, B and C, are also just involving multiple derivatives of these kernels. The important point is that uh, these basically these 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 uh, uh, the, the stuff that goes into the Katz-Rice formula a and lambda they really only depend on the Bergman kernel. That's the important point. <laughs> The more you know about the Bergman kernel in this setting, the more accurately you can estimate everything. Um, so it, this is the reason why the, the limit as the power of the line bundle goes to infinity is so much simpler than the large dimension limit. There are uh, in, in, ex, huge numbers of papers uh, working out the asymptotics of Bergman kernels as powers of line bundles go to infinity. Um, there are essentially one paper working out the asymptotics of Bergman kernels when the dimension of the manifold goes to infinity, which I might come to later on. So now I uh, want to make a comparison to um, spin glass theory. So spin glass theory is based on exactly the same Katz Rice formula. Now, what they do is unlike this, this incredibly complicated setting of moduli space of Colabio manifolds, in spin glass theory, they pick a simple toy model, which is just a sphere of high dimension. And as in the case of the uh, we've just seen in the Katz Rice formula, the key player in these, in these things is the covariance kernel, which we'll see on the next slide. But they pick the covariance kernels to depend only on the inner product of two points on the sphere. And uh, as a result, they're, get, they're able to get much more explicit information about the Katz Rice formula and about its large dimension limits than you could hope to have in the setting of general, like Calabia moduli spaces or just general Kähler manifolds. So I might mention here, well, let's see the next slide. And the next slide is uh, this is the paper of Alfinger and Benaru. So I, I do not believe this paper is familiar to many physicists. And their model is uh, instead of a Clavier moduli space, they take a sphere of radius square root of n uh, in Rn. And so a point on the sphere is just, it's normalized. So you have a point on the sphere, uh, sigma one through sigma n, which uh, well just says that it's on a sphere of radius square root of n. Then the Hamiltonian, so these are the, the analogs of the superpotentials. The Hamiltonians are given by polynomials of some degree P. So these are called P-spin Hamiltonians. And uh, this is just uh, the products of the sigmas with the different indices. So it's a polynomial of degree P and the coefficients here are Gaussian random variables. So you'll see it's exactly the same problem that we're studying, except for the fact that instead of having a superpotential, 
instead of having a super potential, we have this, this kind of random Hamiltonian, instead of having a random super potential. Then the uh, covariance function is just the expected value of the Hamiltonian at the point sigma times the Hamiltonian at the point sigma prime. And it's uh, very simple to work it out from this formula. And so you get uh, n times this, this uh, covariance kernel, uh, which is just the inner product of sigma and sigma prime. I might mention here that if you want to do a complex analog of this to bring this a closer to what we were doing uh, with the Clavier manifolds, instead of doing the sphere of radius n minus one, one can look at complex projective space uh, of dimension n minus one. Um, instead of looking at these p-spin Hamiltonians, one instead of even here, one could have looked at spherical harmonics of some fixed degree. They'll also have very simple covariance kernels, not as simple as these, but simple enough. And so, if you look at uh, uh, the analog of spherical harmonics on complex projective space, uh, just holomorphic polynomials on on the C n plus C n uh, C two n plus one. The uh, C2N, I mean, you get, uh, you get holomorphic sections of what's called the hyperplane line bundle uh, to some fixed power over complex projective space of high dimension. And so you can work out a complex analog of this, uh, which, which uh, is the only toy model that seems really relevant to uh, the Clavier problem. But uh, is, we're going to be exploiting this, the high degree of symmetry of a sphere in these results, and there's no symmetry to use in the case of the clavier moduli space. So what they prove, what they study in, in their works is a, a function called the complexity functions. And the complexity functions in spin glass theory, they first of all, they also are interested in fixing the Morse index of a critical point. And then they count the number of critical values, uh, just the critical values, not the critical points of the random Hamiltonian uh, of index K. And their main result is a, is a um, kind of large deviations principle for this uh, critical point counting. Namely, it's an exponentially growing function uh, as, n as the dimension tends to infinity. The number of critical points of index k is exponentially growing. And so they take the logarithm of the number of critical points and divide by n. And then they, they show, so this is a large deviations equation. They show it's a, this is counting critical points in a ball, uh, or sorry, critical values in some interval. And so you get the supremum of a certain, certain function, which is called the complexity function. You take the supremum of this complexity function in that interval. So all their results basically flow from the calculation of this complexity function, studying where it's maximum and where it's zero. It's a sort of a dream, a wild dream that you could actually come up with, you could calculate any kind of analogous complexity function in, this, in the Clavier problem, but um, it's, it's sort of what is most natural to people in spin glass theory. This is in some sense the, the principal thing that they're studying. So uh, as an example, if you study all the critical points without constraining the Morse index, then uh, they define this particular threshold here and if you look at the expected total number of critical, point, uh, critical values, uh, where you take the logarithm and divide by the dimension, then it tends to uh, this particular number. So, th the, uh, so th it says that you know, the expected total number of critical points, critical values, grows like uh, e to the n times uh, p, you know, this, this, uh, this one half p minus one. 
So this uh, P minus one is the maximal value of theta P. So theta, this uh, theta P is the sum, sum over K of the theta K P's. And there's a similar formula. So sort of predictably, there's a similar formula if you fix the Morse index of the critical points, like you're only interested in minima or maxima. Uh, well, if you fix the Morse index, the number of negative eigenvalues, then uh, they get a similar formula with a slightly different function here because they get, a, they, get uh, they look at, they have to look at this function here. But uh, roughly speaking, the same kind of thing. So um, what that shows is that if you want to go above this threshold, uh, the critical values have to have Morse indices tending to infinity. So that's sort of uh, reminiscent of what we said about the critical points in the, in the Clavial setting, where the, there are only exist critical points uh, of index greater than or equal to M. They have to be at least M. In this case, we call them capital N negative eigenvalues. Automatically, we have to be in this regime where the Morse index is tending to infinity. So actually, that's, uh, that's my last slide. So I think I will finish here. So uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Dave. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. Very nice talk. Uh, I just thought I'd mention a couple of uh, you know, news items uh, on this on this subject. You know, so uh, one of them, uh, Liam McAllister, who's here and, and collaborators, have, have found some explicit examples of uh, you know the, the real quantized flux vacuum on Calabiab with uh, very small values of that Cosmological concept. So you know, explicit solutions so that that's valuable. And uh, then the other is this work of uh, Bakker, Grimm, uh, Schnell, uh, Zimmerman. Have you seen that? No, I've talked to McAllister about his results. In effect, I was asking him, well, here, we let, me, let me say one more thing. Spin glass theory, even what, what I was just described, has, does not have any universality results at present. You know, we're working on the spherical spin glass model. And you get these interesting thresholds for the exponential growth rate of critical values of some Morse index. You know, we don't, it's not known to my, I've talked to my colleague Offinger about this often enough. It's not known that the same types of results hold for more general sequences of manifolds. Like what other ones could you use besides spheres of high dimension? So they lack universality results. So even from the most speculative point of view, you know, it's a little bit, definitely a big leap to think that there could be any kind of a resemblance of the Clavial modulate problem to the spin glass problem that I presented. It's still an interesting question, really somehow you want, in a way what they're saying, the spin glass people are saying, try to calculate this, complexity function. I, I, I talked to uh, McAllister about it and he, he was, he basically did not think that there were any sort of toy models like this that would give you any useful information about the vacuum problem that you really needed to use all the details of the Clavio moduli space, right? And I think that's what you were saying also. Right, yeah, okay, yeah, I, I, I won't argue, and he, he here can, can, can speak for himself, but, uh, but let me mention this, this other work. So, so the thing which, well, I, I mean, I'll tell you what the result is. They proved that the number of, you know, these actual quantized flux vacua for any actual Calabial threefold moduli space is finite. And, uh, uh -huh. so, and, and they do it using techniques that got applied to, uh, you know, the, the Hodge conjecture, you're counting algebraic cycles and so forth, and this theory of uh, mm -hmm. O-minimal structures, which uh, 
you know, this comes out of logic and uh, turns out to be applicable to your situation. Who, who is this that you, who are you talking well, about? Well, three mathematicians, uh, Backer, uh, Schnell, and uh, Zimmerman. And uh, then a physicist. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I know they, the, I know them. Right, right. So they, they, they took these uh, Hodge uh, theory techniques and they applied it to this problem, you know, literally, literally this problem. So the uh, number of, uh, you, know, you know, I mean, we know that the, the integral over this moduli space is uh, finite. You know, that was this thing like the decision loop, but the actual problem with the quantized boxes, the number is finite. Uh huh. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, the, when you say that they did this, so there's in the background one has to pick a Clavio manifold X and then so study modulation. That's about the Hodge theory. That's right. You pick an X and then it's finite. Yeah. For any X, any any yeah. Clavio threefold. Yeah. yeah. I see. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. They don't have any idea how many there are, do they? <laughs> no, no, no. I was talking with uh, Thomas Grimm about this. There, there's some sort of ways of using these to, to count something, but it wasn't clear it was counting these lattice points, but I'm not exploring that. Uh-huh. Well, in your opinion, what is the, ver what is the relevance to, in this day and age of the random theory? Well, okay, that, that's a that's a, a, a good question. You know, so things evolved. You know, there's been quite a bit of work. Uh, there's this whole other branch of the literature that's actually skeptical about the existence of this flux vacuum. Right? That's kind of a different uh, discussion. Uh, there's various works that suggest that uh, either there are additional elements of the problem that change the kind of thing, or or there's this interesting conjecture that says that uh, the uh, you know, given this uh, tadpole number, although these numbers are, 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 are correct, many of these vacua have uh, very small uh, Hessian, you know, so very small mass masses in this uh, physics language. And uh, so we somehow need to count the number of taking that into account and that will bring the numbers down. You know, there, there was a particular paper, uh, an infamous paper by uh, Wadi Taylor and one of his students where if you look at, uh, so you know, with the, the elliptic vibration over the threefold is a fourfold. And then if you look at, the fourfold with the largest uh, Euler character, you find some number like uh, 10 to 160,000 back here. And uh, so this, this number seemed kind of uh, disgusting. You know? And then there was some effort to uh, try to figure out, you know, may, may, you know, is, you know, is there some reason why that number is a huge overestimate? And then, and then that result I cited earlier about the masses, you know, what's what's called a tadpole conjecture is, is, is relevant for that. That probably gets rid of a lot of those back here. So uh, I think it's, a, it's it's open whether this is uh, directly applicable, but I, I still think it will be applicable. Uh, let me ask you a question. When you think about the cosmological constant, you know, the, the spin glass uh, results say that in effect, if you fix the Morse index divided by the dimension in a particular, you know, to tend to some limit, uh, did I, oh, 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 sorry, I actually did, I, I didn't go to the last slide. So actually on my, <laughs> on my last slide, I stated something which is relevant to my question. So if you, if you, so for us, the more indices will be tending to infinity with the dimension. And if you tend to a particular number of gamma, then uh, the empirical measure of, of, of critical points has the, uh, ten, has the following limit in the bottom equation, that it's, it's really a beautiful result that the empirical measure tends to a delta function of one particular critical value, which depends on gamma. In other words, you get an exponential concentration of critical values around one specific E critical, you know, the EC of gamma, you get exponential concentration as long as the ratio of Kn over N tends to gamma. So these are like, in some sense, you might say the only possible observable values, critical values, if you know how the, how the ratio of the Morse index to the dimension will limit. Now think about what the analog of that, if anything like that were true, 
in the Kalaviyev setting. In effect, yeah. in effect, it would say something like, you know, if you know what the Morse indices are of uh, of of the critical points, if you if you constrain the Morse indices, and in these cat's rice formulas, you can always constrain the Morse indices. If you constrain the Morse indices, so I don't know. If you look at the cosmological constant, you know, there's no constraint that I'm aware of on the Morse indices of the superpotentials, right? With that critical value. But if you had some idea of a priori idea about what the Morse index of the super of the critical point that gives that cosmological constant, <laughs> you might say that that cosmological constant ought to be <laughs> one of these one of these critical values, one of these threshold critical values. See what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Like it. <laughs> it's like uh, you can't observe somehow, you know, if you have exponential concentration to a physicist, not that I can speak to physicists about what a physicist thinks, but a physicist would say those are the only observable values, critical values. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, um, so maybe cosmological yeah. constant is constrained to be one of them. Yeah, yeah, no, no, definitely analogs of what you're talking about would be very important. I mean, the one that uh, comes to mind, again, I, mean, I should say that, that you know, that the problem you know, that we treated is, is one of the most salient differences, of course, is that that effective potential is, that, you know, potential V is uh, quadratic in, in the Hessian of, of W, right? And so already from the start, I mean, it's, it's not literally the square of something, but it's a lot like the square of something. And uh, so that already gives you some, you know, positivity. But uh, then, you know, having said that, of course, all that was, you know, in, in the physics literature and, and the, the result that uh, at least re this is the most reminiscent of is another result of, uh, you know, Ian McAllister and collaborators from, I, I think, like 2011, where, where they, they wrote a paper called the wasteland of random supergravity. Yeah, I think I've seen that. I think I've seen that one. The difficulty of getting a high cosmological constant with uh, you know, the zero Morse index, which we would call, you know, without tachyons. So, mm -hmm. so definitely there are, there, that's a result of this, this broad flavor. Yeah, yeah, but, but yeah, yeah this, this, this sort of asymptotic, I think, is, is, is important, yeah. Maybe I can briefly comment on yeah. that. Steve, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. So. Um, Right. So, so just in response to this sort of general collection of of statements, um, I totally agree that this sort of layering phenomenon, where the critical points uh, with different Morse indices are are found in very characteristic places, would be a, a beautiful structure to try to find in, in the string theory setting. And um, mm -hmm. indeed. That work of ours in 2011 was related to trying to understand whether statements that that Mike and Frederick had made and that you and uh, Schiffman and Mike had made um, could be applied there. And really what we foundered on there um, is something that Mike explained to me shortly after our, uh, our, our 2011 paper, which is if one wanted to go much further than making uh, statements based on universality assumptions, one needs to start to get into the weeds, get into the details of specific superpotentials and, and killer potentials. And in a way, um, the, the work of ours that Mike referred to first about finding examples with small cosmological constant is of a very different flavor. It's actually, a, it's constructive, uh, it's enumerative and not statistical. And it's an attempt roughly to respond to this comment that Mike made that one actually needs more details uh, in order to see structures like this in the Kalabia context. And so that's that's what I'll talk about on Friday. By the way, are you, I can't tell who you. I guess you're Liam, aren't you? I am. Here I am. Yeah. yeah. I, maybe you can't see. Yeah, I'm sitting. No, sorry, I, sitting I can't see it from here. Um, yeah. No. That's uh, actually well. You you put that idea in my head also, but uh, that's uh, also the kind of conclusion that I have. You know, they don't have any universality results, even in these toy model arenas, for spin glass theory, and. You know, it's a, a huge leap to think that you you can avoid all of the special details of the Kalabia moduli problem and just use kind of universality principles to to like constrain the possible you know cosmological constants. For example, it, it sounds w way too easy. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it would be interesting if there was some some sort of structure like that. Yeah. 
Well, this Hodge theory, there is an interesting structure coming from the you know, asymptotic Hodge theory that, that mm -hmm. you know, something one can use. Yeah. More questions? Okay, maybe. let's. Oh, you have a question? Well, maybe a quick one. Since you talk about spin glass theory, the one thing people do there is compute overlaps or distances between vacua. And then maybe if you are lucky, find this nice ultra metric structure. Has anyone tried to do this for the landscape? Yes. Actually, could you can you uh, enlarge on what you said? You could. I, I I know a little, just a tiny bit about like distances between the critical points. You're saying? Yes. So some notion of distance between the critical points, and then um, try to see uh, yes the statistics of this. In particular, what was the other? Could you could you re, could you repeat the other thing that you said? You use some some term that I haven't heard before. Oh, uh, ultra metric means that ultra metric structures. Yeah. Yes, yes. I, I, uh, I personally, I don't really don't know anything about it, so I can't really respond. But uh, uh, my colleague Alfinger, he does study a lot of people study these ultra metric structures. I don't. I, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's been done for this string theory landscape. It might be interesting. Let me let me just add as one more comment that, yeah, of course, you know, these, these these things you're talking about are also of interest in the machine learning. You know, for example, there was this uh, much asked question of uh, people use these kind of relatively simplistic gradient descent optimization, mm -hmm. and then there was this old argument that the uh, objective function that you're trying to optimize by any kind of normal standard will look incredibly non-convex and how can you ever find a useful minimum? And uh, then it, indeed, it is these kinds of results, at least people point at them and give reasons why this is not a problem, which empirically it's not such a problem. Mm -hmm. So there's another connection that uh, one could flesh out. Okay, that was a productive discussion. We we'll almost solved the same like a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's thank Steve again for. Really